Yosemite National Park is a United States National Park located in Eastern California, spanning 759,620 acres across four different counties. Yosemite has garnered renown worldwide for its breathtaking and diverse scenery, which makes it a popular sightseeing and outdoor recreation destination. And Yosemite National Park sees over 4 million visitors each year. Over 90% of Yosemite is designated as wilderness area, and the park hosts an expansive variety of flora and fauna and many diverse ecosystems within it. One of the park's most striking and appealing features are the sheer, towering granite cliffs that loom above the thickly forested valleys below them. Yosemite's unique topography was formed over a span of millions of years after tectonic movements due to its location in a subduction zone, which eventually formed a small valley. As the valley was slowly eroded by the streams that ran through it, the tectonic movements caused the edges of the canyon to tilt away from each other, which caused the slope of the valley to steepen, which in turn caused more water to flow to it and through it at greater speeds, which in turn hastened the widening and deepening of the valley. Approximately 3 million years ago from present day, the Earth would see the first of a series of ice ages which caused glacial caps to advance that then formed into glaciers as the ice accumulated atop higher ground which subsequently filled the valleys below them with glacial flows. As a result, the erosion of the valley below was exponentially expedited as the massive glacial flows pushed away the weaker sediment and bedrock downfield, which subsequently left only the structurally sound granite bedrock in its wake. This is also the reason for the iconic, smooth, almost polished appearance of Yosemite's sheer cliff sides as well, as the movement of the glacial flows both broke free all but the strongest bedrock, as I mentioned previously, and also polished the remaining granite as it flowed along. Naturally, Yosemite's imposing granite slabs have been an appealing destination for rock climbers since the inception of the sport, and it has garnered a prolific reputation as one of, if not the most premier rock climbing destinations in the entire world, and a favorite locale of some of the world's best climbers including two of which I've covered previously on the channel, the father of free solo rock climbing legend John Backer, and legendary rock climber and daredevil Dean Potter, and Dean would ultimately lose his life within Yosemite as well. While John and Dean had vastly different personalities and temperaments, they also shared many similarities as well, as they were both elite, eccentric, top-level climbers who pushed the boundaries of what was humanly possible and the risks that were necessary to navigate in order to push the boundaries even further. And Yosemite National Park is the perfect ground from which to push these limits within the sport of rock climbing, as Yosemite's granite siren songs are particularly infatuating to elite climbers who are willing to take the biggest risks. Perhaps the most willing to take such risks amongst Yosemite's climbers was a man named Zach Milligan. Zach Milligan grew up in the city of Tucker, Georgia, and enjoyed spending time outdoors in his childhood, frequently going for hikes and adventures outside. But, in contrast to many of the high-level climbers I've covered on the channel, Zach had no interest in rock climbing during his formative years. After high school, Zach entered the workforce finding work as an electrician's apprentice, where he would work a busy schedule with as many as 60 hours of work a week. However, at age 18, the trajectory of Zach's life would drastically and unexpectedly change one day when he went to a barber shop to get a haircut and noticed a poster on the wall with a picture of Yosemite's iconic half dome, where he recounted thinking, quote, I was like, where is that? I knew I needed to climb it. Then, I went to Mountain Ventures, a since-closed climbing retailer in Atlanta, and saw a picture of Peter Croft soloing the rostrum, and that completed it. Whatever that is, 
that's what I am now, he later recounted of his climbing career's origins. At this mountain venture store, Zack purchased some ropes and the necessary climbing equipment and vigorously began to teach himself how to climb, and he enthusiastically solo-led pitches, down climbing each one of them to further refine his skills and strength. He trained diligently, completing a sense of over a hundred pitches over the course of the following year. At age 19, Zach uprooted from Georgia, moving to Denver, Colorado, as Denver offered many more opportunities for Zach to further refine his climbing skills than the U.S. East Coast could offer him, and found electrician work there as a means to support himself. Zach quickly assimilated into the local rock climbing scene, and his intense drive for improvement, as well as his solo lead climbing experience, led him to begin experimenting with free solo climbing after he was challenged to free solo ascend the Bastille Crack, a simple 5-7 rated climb. Free solo climbing is a topic I've covered several times in videos on my channel, but for those of you that are unaware, free solo climbing is the act of climbing without the use of any safety equipment, which is differentiated from lead solo climbing, as lead solo climbing is performed with ropes. Free solo climbing is the most extreme discipline within the sport of rock climbing, and only a small percentage of climbers attempt free solo ascents, as the consequences for even a single mistake can mean death or grievous bodily injury at best should one happen to lose their grip and fall. After completing an ascent of the Bastille Crack with relative ease, Zack's anxiety about free solo climbing was greatly relieved, and he soon followed up this ascent with an ascent of the more challenging 5-7 plus climb, Osiris. And although the route was more technically challenging, it was during this ascent of Osiris that he truly realized that he was not afraid of this sort of climbing, recalling, quote, It had off widths on it, and that was my first taste of wide climbing, soloing that shit. That's when I learned I could keep it together and was not afraid of heights, Zack later recounted of the climb. The following winter, Zack returned to Georgia, where he paid a visit to his favorite gear supply store, Mountain Ventures, where he inquired about ice climbing and the equipment needed to partake in it, and the owner of the shop, who knew well of Zack's enthusiasm, loaned him his own personal ice climbing equipment to test out. Zack immediately leapt in his car and drove to a spot in North Carolina to try out the gear, and after experiencing his first taste of ice climbing, Zack was hooked, and immediately returned to Mountain Ventures to return the gear, and subsequently purchased a full set of ice climbing equipment for himself, before he set off for Colorado once more. This time, his destination was the city of Silverton, which was host to a bevy of ice to climb that sustained itself in a climbable state for most of the year round. Upon his arrival in Silverton, Zack immediately set to work honing his ice climbing skills, and within a week of his arrival, he had free soloed a WI4 rated route named Stairway to Heaven, which earned him the nickname Georgia Ice within the local ice climbing scene. Following a productive season of ice climbing in Silverton, Zack packed his things and again headed west. This time, his destination was Yosemite National Park. Upon arriving at Yosemite that summer, Zack found himself both overwhelmed and enamored by the vast quantities of rocks to climb and the number of highly skilled climbers there. Zack didn't fit in as well within the Yosemite climbing scene and his self-described, condescending, self-depreciating, and blunt remarks earned him the nickname Hater Zack within some circles, and thus, Zack mostly kept to himself, free soloing routes up cliff faces without doing any research about them beforehand, roughing it as he slept and cooked simple campfire meals amongst the many boulders littered throughout the park. In order to sustain himself, Zack picked up a job as a dishwasher at a local hotel. However, during this rather short-lived job at the hotel, he was far from a model employee, as he seemingly showed up for work whenever he pleased, 
and would openly drink while on the job. After a short stint at the hotel, he was summarily fired, with his termination slip amusingly reading, quote, Fastest dishwasher I've ever seen, but worst employee ever. Do not rehire, it read. He then found work with Yosemite's custodial service, a job which he clearly liked significantly better, as he would remain at this job for the next 13 years. It was also around this time that while wandering through the wilderness of Yosemite, that Zack would happen across a cave which would become his home for the next 13 years as well. During these years, Zack would complete numerous free solo ascents within the park, including 275 separate free solo ascents of the 510 rated Steck Salath route on the 1600 foot Sentinel Wall, 20 free solo ascents of the northwest face of Half Dome, and his personal favorite free solo ascent, an ascent of the difficult 510C rated East Buttress route of Lower Cathedral Wall. However, after more than a decade spent doing janitorial work and living in a cave, his unique lifestyle had begun to wear on Zack, and so he decided to start his own flooring company, setting up shop in Bozeman, Montana, although he would still make frequent trips to visit Yosemite after his relocation. On February 21st, 2021, Zack would complete perhaps his most daring and noteworthy feat in Yosemite to date, when he and a man named Jason Torlano made history when they successfully skied down half dome steep and slick 60 degree slopes. Notably, when he was interviewed following the descent, Zack remarked that he didn't even consider himself a real skier, stating, quote, I wasn't in a survivable situation. I had no business being on Half Dome. I'm not a real skier, he remarkably said in an interview, despite the daring and historic descent. Which, for reference, a ski descent of the entirety of K2 was completed two years before Zack and Jason would make their historic attempt and successful ski descent of Half Dome. In February of 2023, Zach traveled to the Canadian Rockies for an ice climbing excursion with the region boasting some of the world's most premier and renowned ice climbs. Zach had set his sights on and geared up for a free solo ascent of one of the world's most coveted ice climbs, an ascent of Polar Circus, a route located on Cirrus Mountain in the province of Alberta. He then packed his things and headed to the site of the climb in his vehicle. On February 10th, 2023, Parks Canada officials received a report of an abandoned vehicle in a nearby parking lot, and on February 11th, a drone search was ordered to search for Zach. They found his body at the bottom of Polar Circus, as he had died from an apparent fall, which had gone unwitnessed. Following his death, his family refused an official autopsy, as his cause of death was quite apparent, and thus, his death was deemed accidental, as his family members knew that he died doing what he loved, free solo climbing. Quote, He was a world-class climber, incredible alpine skier, gifted musician, wicked smart, he could tell a wildly entertaining story and make almost anything funny. He will be missed more deeply then there are words, said his sister Martha Milligan following his passing. Another of his friends described him as, quote, He was like a marathon fit rock climber, dedicated dirtbag to the core, but also an intellectual, a real larger than life person, they said. Ultimately, Zach tragically died while doing what he was the best at and loved the most free solo climbing. And as another friend and climbing partner once described him, quote, He's the only person I know who gets worse when on a rope, they remarked. This is likely because, like the other free solo climbers I've covered on the channel, Zach described free solo climbing as a meditative, almost religious experience, stating, quote, You feel like you're in contact with God. It makes me feel like I'm in a magical place he described of his numerous daring free solo attempts. Zack was 42 years old at the time of his death.
Thank you all for watching.